Hello, 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 and welcome back to this, our Intro to African History Lecture Series here on your Pan-African Lectures channel. I am your host, as always, Dr. Shengima Vima. And today we are focusing on the second part in our mini-series, you know, series within a series, uh, focusing on, on the overthrow of colonialism in Africa. Last week we spent some time talking about the overthrow of colonialism in West Africa and North Africa. And today we are focusing on East Africa and Central Africa. Again, in these spaces, in, the, in these territories we're selecting, specific spaces we'll be looking at. And these include today, we're talking about Tanzania, Kenya, uh, the Belgian Congo, Madagascar, Rwanda. So these are some of the places we'll be talking about. And we'll just be running through them uh, in an introductory way. If you haven't already, make sure you like, subscribe to this channel so you can, you can, um, you can keep abreast of the series. And I'll be putting other videos as well on African history that are outside of the Intro to African History series. Very soon I'm working on that. Um, let's go ahead and get started then. Okay, and just like that, we're cooking with gas and I'll see you guys at the end. In East Africa, Tanzania took the lead in the independence movement. As with other parts of the continent, it was, funda it, it was fundamental fallout in the post-World War II era that facilitated the surge in African nationalism in what was then Tanganyika. And Tanganyika is pictured here in the green right, in, in Tanganyika. In 1951, thousands of Meru farmers, the ethnic group Meru farmers, were forced to leave their land to accommodate a handful of white settlers. Now remember that Tanzania was never a settler colony in that way, but a handful of them were looking to settle there. And as colonial appropriation of land goes, they were going to push thousands of farmers to accommodate a handful of, of, of these British farmers. This spurred political activism led by the Tanza Tanganyika African National Union, or known as TANU, led by this gentleman pictured here, who is Julius Nyerere. Julius Nyerere. Modeled in large part after Kwame Nkrumah's CPP, the party received massive rural support, right? So in many ways, remember Kwame Nkrumah's uh, Ghana had become independence, uh, independent in, the 19, in 1957, and uh, the CPP movement had been around since the 1940s. So in many ways, some of the leaders who were coming up modeled their, their system of governance or their political parties after after the CPP. Nyerere had been educated at the University of Makerere uh, in Uganda, which is the foremost university in East Africa and one of the best in Africa, before going to graduate school at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Due to the continuous pressure by Tanu and Nyerere, the British began conceding some control, initially proposing a multiracial uh, constitution which was just a disguised way of making sure that the very few white and Asian people resident in the area maintained the loudest voice. This didn't go through, of course, and in 1961, Tanganyika received independence with Nyerere becoming president. So right now we're still talking about Tanganyika, right? Well, where does Tanzania come from? Now, Tanzania is not just the post-colonial name of Tanganyika, no. So in 1961, Tanganyika becomes independent. In December 1963, the British accorded Zanzibar its freedom and, and gave it over to the leadership of the, of the, of the Sultan. You know, remember uh, Zanzibar as one of the Sahel coast islands had for a long time been under the control of, um, of Omani descendants. So it's very prominent Arab uh, leadership there. However, the Arab Sultan who had taken over was almost immediately thrown, overthrown by the African masses in Zanzibar who were now 
inspired by the wave of African nationalism that was fully on hold across the continent. So when we're talking about Zanzibar, we're talking about these islands here. In April 1964, then, after his overthrow in um, a few months earlier, Tanganyika and Zanzibar were amalgamated into Tanzania. So that's why we say the independence comes in April 1964. So Tanzania is an amalgamation of Tanganyika and Zanzibar. So when you blend those names, you get Tanzania. Like many post-colonial thinkers and leaders, Nyerere sought to establish a break from the capitalist system that had grown synonymous with colonialism and thus initiated a system of nation building called Ujama, Ujama, which is here, um, also known as, uh, which was, uh, I, don't, I won't say it translates into, but it is virtually an African system of socialism, which, you know, conversations have been had about, and maybe we'll have them later on this channel. They are more philosophical about its successes and its failures, with the summation of it that ultimately Ujama was a cultural success, but not so much an economic success. So that's a little bit about, about, about Tanzania. In Kenya, a slightly different proposition to its neighbor. Kenya was a somewhat of a settler colony though not to the extent of Rhodesia or Algeria or South Africa. As such, the brutality upon the people and the pushback from the Africans, right, African nationalism was elevated. The main revolutionary movement emerging in the 1940s was the Mau Mau, Mau Mau, right, which grew out of the Kikuyu people but was also supported by the Embu and Meru people who were mainly uh, landless peasants or what they called squatters, whose property had been seized by the white settlers. The Mau Mau struggle was punctuated by rural violence, manifesting through labor strikes, burning of buildings and other forms of sabotage. And the violence increased in the early 1950s with attacks on the, on the white settlers and, and as well as African collaborators. The colonial government reacted by arresting hundreds of the African political leaders, among them the likes of Jomo Kenyatta, who would go on to become the president of, of Kenya at independence, and also bringing in several British soldiers for reinforcements as well as putting in place a brutal state of emergency that lasted from 1952 till 1959, I believe, right? So in which, you know, there was curfews and people were sent to camps, you know, concentration camps, which are very, very brutal. I'll also include a short video that describes the conditions in those camps in the description uh, section before. So, so, and I'm, the, the thing that happened though is the movement could not be curtailed by the arrest of these leaders because remember what I explained, it was, it was a rural, uh, it was a grassroots movement. So even though they arrested the elites, the likes of Jomo Kenyatta and uh, Tom Boyer, the movement did not stop, it kept going because it was bubbling from, it was a rural people's, it was a people's movement, right? So that was the Mau Mau and it continued to do damage. So much damage that the Mau Mau uprisings are reported as being the, the death toll around 11,000, that's the official number, including more than a thousand people hanged by the colonial government. Surprisingly, only 32 white people were killed with the vast majority of course being Africans. However, the, the other, other sources, for example, Professor David Anderson of Oxford University says the death toll is closer to 25,000, so twice as high as the official numbers have, right? So, and, oh, and this picture here is of Dida and Kimati, who was one of the grassroots leaders, very, to this day, is revered. There's actually a statue of him in the Njeri region in Kenya, um, who was the leader of the Mau Mau, and he was executed in 1957. After the end of the state of emergency, the British begrudgingly accepted uh, the principle of majority rule by 1960. Um, Jomo Kenyatta, president of the Kenyan African National Union, KANU, 
would become the first democratically elected president in 1964. And some of his peers at the time, uh, with the likes of Oginga Odinga, uh, Tom Boyer, who Tom Boyer was killed a couple of years into, into independence. And Oginga Odinga, the, the, here's an interesting tidbit. Uh, Oginga Odinga's son is, is Raila Odinga, and Jomo Kenyatta's son is uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. And those two are uh, the two most prominent political leaders, albeit on, in opposing parties in Kenya right now. So they're almost like legacy leaders, if you will. So that's a little bit about Kenya and its road to independence. Now, unlike the French and the British, right, that we have seen already, the Belgians were not even thinking about granting independence to their colonies in the region. Not at all. In the aftermath of the Second World War. The idea was not even mentioned around them in, until 1956, which is a far cry, even though independence came mostly after that, even in the British and the French colonies. The conversations were happening since the 1940s uh, as a result of imperial fatigue. But the, the Belgians, they were not even thinking that. As such, the Belgians kept a tight grip on information flow to the country. They could not let the Africans in their country, in their territory, in their colony, know what was happening elsewhere, lest it sparked this uh, post-World War nationalism or radicalism, right? So they, they kept a tight grip on that. And you, you could only go to primary school. There was no higher education. Again, recognizing fully how the educated elites, the likes of Julius Nyerere, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, Kwame Nkrumah had been in large part the driving forces behind uh, the calls to independence, right? By 1956, the African elites, previously called the Evolues, remember we spoke about the system of, of direct rule through which, which was popular in French and Belgian colonies, through which sophisticated, educated Africans and these quote unquote civilized could uh, evolve into full French or Belgian people. And that's where the term of Wallaway comes from. But these guys were, began to clamor for their rights, and uh, political and economic rights. And to placate them, the Belgians allowed the African politicians to contest in local elections in select cities across the country. So that, the idea was you put them in these places and they will, they will chill out, right? They won't ask for much more. However, it had the opposite effect after they had tasted that victory and autonomy of, of being in charge, uh, the African nationalists uh, started pursuing national political power and set up a time of independence. This is in the mid 1950s. So they set up a time of independence between 1961 and 1965, they wanted independence. From among these leaders, so, the idea of them setting up this uh, timeline of independence was pretty different from other places in the continent, from other nationalist movements in the, in the continent, because the rest were saying, we want independence and we want it right away. So that was a pretty generous timeline on their part. From these African leaders, Patrice Lumumba, uh, pictured here, and we'll tell his story uh, a little more in a bit, emerged as the most prominent. His fervor for independence and sovereignty was further sparked when he attended the All African People's Convention in recently independent Ghana in 1958. So Kwame Nkrumah, the Pan-Africanist that he was, had started to host these events that, were, that, would, that he was hoping would foster African unity. And uh, Lumumba had attended one of those meetings and been inspired and even more radical than it already been. But if the Belgians had been determined to hold on to their territories, they're beginning to reconsider as radicalism spread across the country with the likes of Lumumba coming back and, and sparing this radicalism. By 19, 1959, they feared a full out war on power with the Algerian revolution. And after quick meetings in, in Brussels, decided to pull out of the Congo immediately, calling for elections within six months. 
Now remember that the timeline that the African nationalists had given was between 1961 and 1965. So this really preempted them. They did not anticipate that Belgians would say like, you know what, we are out and figure it out right away. So this preempted them and 120 political parties emerged to contest the 137 parliamentary seats. That is insane. That is almost a party for each seat, right? Uh, being contested for. Lumumba, who had been imprisoned for inciting violence at the time of the decision, was released and emerged as the country's prime minister, heading a very shaky coalition government because, you know, such will happen when you have 120 parties you have to represent. In a matter of days, though, in his control, uh, things began to sour quickly, began to sour quickly. So he emerges as prime minister in 1960. Um, the army mutinied against the continued presence of Belgian soldiers as their superiors. Um, so the army decided they did not want to be part of this government as long as the Belgians who had sort of established their presence in the country um, so as to protect their own interests. As long as the Belgian soldiers stayed in control of the military, the, the African military uh, mutinied. And also the mineral-rich Katanga region, which we've spoken about before, uh, seceded from the country. And it was led by Moisa Chompe, Chombe and was supported by one of the companies brought in by King Leopold some six decades earlier. Other support from the Wantaway state came from Belgium while the U.S. pressured the U.N. to not get involved in this un unraveling on, on Lumumba's behalf. So Lumumba himself is removed after a coup by U.S.-backed Army General Joseph Mobutu. Joseph Mobutu, uh, he was arrested and, and taken away from uh, the Congo into the seceded Katanga region where he was uh, tortured, him and, 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 and peers. He was tortured and uh, eventually executed, uh, you know, by firing squad upon the order of the Belgians in January, 1961, after which his bo bones were dis his body was dissolved in acid. And the reason he was assassinated, put simply, his ideas for radical transformation were at odds with the Belgians and other Westerners' hopes of maintaining economic control of the region. So at his inaugural speech, the Belgian king at, at Lumumba's, at independence, the Belgian king gave a speech first in which he said, uh, King Leopold was a great man and you Africans should be thankful and, um, you know, don't be, don't be quick to make tra uh, transformations here. Uh, you know, pretty much which was a plea for, for the Africans to, to maintain the status quo, to almost be just nominal leaders while preserving Belgian economic and politi political control. And I think a speech had been written for, for Lumumba that sort of uh, co-signed that narrative. However, Lumumba being the, the radical that he was, gave his own speech, which was all for that castigated severely the colonial system and spoke about transformation and the empowerment of the Africans. And from then on, he was at odds with the, with the Belgians and, and other Western forces. So he became, you know, he was essentially martyred for that reason, right? And interestingly though, Joseph Mobutu was uh, supported by the Brit, was backed by the US and took power in 1965 he went on to become one of the most brutal dictators post-colonial uh, Africa has ever seen. Uh, to this day, I think very few, very few uh, dictators uh, who have been as brutal. And the fact that his reign was, lasted so long as well from 1965 until he was removed by Laurent Kabila in 1997. So that's more than 30 years of, of terror that inflicted, and it was terror indeed uh, that inflicted on, on the continent. So that's a little bit about how independence came around in, the, in, in, in Belgian ruled Central Africa and the Belgian Congo in particular. <laughs>
while Rwanda was also under Belgian control, Belgian colonial rule, the Belgians were actually obligated to prepare this country for independence, which they were not obligated for in, in, uh, in, the, in the Congo. And actually, Rwanda and Burundi were governed together at the time, but they were, so the Belgians were mandated to prepare them for independence as separate countries though. The citizenry of Rwanda largely comprised of two groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. Historically, these two have been economic categorizations as opposed to ethnic groups. In the pre-colonial era, the Tutsis were pastoralists, right, cattle herders, while the Hutus were peasants, more farmers and, and, and such. Now in East African societies where cattle were king, where, where currency, the Tutsi soon emerged as elites, right? Because they were the, the, the pastoralists, while the more numerous Hutus were a less dominant caste. But because it was class-based, it was a class system, it was not unheard of for, for somebody who was part of the Bahutu people to make their way up the economic class and become regarded as, as Tutsi. So it was not, a, again, it was an, an ethnic difference at the time. With the advent of colonialism, however, the Belgians would seize on these differences in typical divide and rule fashion, building up a narrative that they were primordial ethnic differences between the two groups. The Tutsis, you know, smaller group and more, and regarded as elites already, were made somewhat of junior colonial partners. So they were uh, given a status that was fast, that was significantly superior to the Hutu masses. Um, and made sort of junior partners with this, this, within this colonial project. Thus, when the era of African nationalism grew in the aftermath of the Second World War, the parties were organized along these quote-unquote ethnic lines, right? Now they are starting to manifest themselves as ethnic as opposed to economic. The Tutsis demanded immediate independence in such a way that they could remain in control or remain with their, maintain their privileged status and compared to the Hutu masses. While the Hutus were advocating for, Hutu elites were advocating for majority rule, uh, which they knew would serve them best because they were indeed the, the majority. As this is in the 1940s, 1950s. As the tensions began between the two rows, the Belgians, right, again, talk about the cunning and uh, a moral way in which the colonial structures work. The Belgians turned their allegiance to the Hutus, who were more numerous. So even though they had empowered the Tutsis and, and made them junior partners in the colonial system, when it looked like uh, uh, independence was on the verge, they turned their allegiance to the Hutus who were more numerous. And what does that do? That would mean that should they win the popular vote, um, the Belgians will not be run out of town, you know? So they're just being cunning. As such, and the, as the political tensions between the two groups increased, as such, there were massacres of the Tutsi people in 1959 and 1960, in which hundreds died and many fled into exile into Tanzania, Uganda, and Burundi. Some of the exiled Tutsis now in Uganda continue to launch attacks on the Hutus in Rwanda, but I don't know if this was enough to stop a Hutu-led government coming into power at independence in 1961. So the, 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 the Hutu majority um, and their candidate won that election with ease, right? Because not only were they more numerous than the Tutsis to start with, the Tutsis, many of the Tutsis had also been persecuted and, and run away from, from the country into exile. Now in 1990, the exiled Tutsis, about 4,000, numbering about 4,000, organizing from Uganda, now organizes a Rwandan patriotic front and led by, by uh, some prominent figures, one of, whom relevant to this day uh, was Paul Kagame, who was the deputy commander of the army of, of the of the Rhodesian uh, of the Rwandan. Sorry, sorry about that. Of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, 
who took over when the when the leader was killed almost immediately into their into their attack on on Rwanda. So they 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 come into Rwanda, and because they are a smaller force, they are restricted to the mountains, sort of doing sabotage projects away from the main area. While overall anti Tutsi tensions had mellowed out over the decades as the country focused on the economy, there remained ultra Hutu groups that were determined to exterminate all Tutsis, including actually um, while the president of the Rwandan president at the time, Habi Arimana, was a moderate, his wife's family, Agatha, Habi Arimana, and, and, and that clan, you know, which is an old pre-colonial clan that was uh, that was an elite clan among the Hutus, uh, also known in French as Clan de Madame or the Madame's clan, were among the ultra Hutus who were very anti Tutsi and wanted uh, to exterminate the Tutsis, right? And this group was known as the Hutu Power Movement. In April 1994, Rwandan President Abiyarimana arranged to meet with Kagame and other folks uh, to organize a ceasefire. But peace was not the goal for the, remember, the extreme Hutus, who again, the, the president was. He was not among them, but but his wife's family was. So his plane was, uh, the president's plane was shot down on April 6th. And this killing is largely, and him and everybody on plane, including the Burundi president, who was also Hutu, were killed. And this marked essentially the beginning of the Rwandan genocide. This is in 1994. And also it marked this trend of killing not just the Tutsis, but killing the moderate Hutus as well. And many of the, of the government leaders who were Hutus were killed. In 100 days, more than 800,000 people were killed, mostly Tutsis, but also a third of the Twa population, um, who are often regarded as the forgotten victims of this. Uh, ten, uh, tens of thousands of them were killed as well, as well as many moderate Hutus. The conflict, is also renowned for the silence and or complicity of the international community. The US still reeling from the events of Black Hawk Down in Somalia a year earlier, chose to sit this one out. The UN had had a tiny peacekeeping force that was ill-equipped for any of this. French banks had fronted the purchase of machetes using the massacre from China. <clears throat> And these were also smuggled through Uganda. When it looked said that Kagame and the RPF would re-seize the country, millions of Hutus, particularly many who had been responsible for the massacres, fled into Zaire, uh, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, at the time under the leadership of Mobutu, who we just spoke about, under the guise of seeking refuge from genocide, while they were actually the killers themselves, uh, seeking to get away. So, that's a little bit about, about the Rwandan genocide, and these are the bones here. I'll put videos in the description below that focus particularly on this, on this, uh, on this period, including a fantastic poem that tells the story as well that I really like. So, <clears throat> this goes on to become eight hundred thousand people killed in a hundred days in one of the most one of the darkest moments of human history in recent years. And remember that these people are being killed largely by machetes, right? So people are being chopped down. There are stories of, of people running away, running off into churches or schools to seek refuge. Um, 1,500 people, 2,000 people in a church. And uh, the priest happens to be in cahoots with the Hutu power movement, locks up the building, and allows the, the 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 killers to come in and and chop down, you know, these two thousand people within the church, you know, where sought refuge in the church. And these are the stories that come out of this movement, that, that come out of this very ugly episode. And to this day, actually, it is criminal to to be a denialist of um, of the events. <clears throat> 
of this of this episode in in Rwanda. Uh, to this day, the government is uh, is governed pretty heavy handedly. As well, um, and also one of the things that you'd be ill advised to do is if you meet Rwandan people to ask them if they're Hutus or Tutsis. That is something that is severely frowned upon now, right? People are just regarded as being Rwandan because this idea of ethnic differences is largely attributed with uh, is largely associated with uh, the Rwandan genocide. Now, I always like to throw in, and I know it's a pretty somber moment here, but I like to throw in Madagascar, or at least one of the islands, so that we don't forget about the islands. We have Madagascar, we have the Seychelles, we have Comoros, we have Mauritania, uh, sorry, not Mauritania, uh, Mauritius, uh, Sao Tome and Principe. We have several islands that constitute, that are African nations that usually don't get brought up in these conversations. But in any case, so earlier we spoke about how there had been the Menalamba Rebellion in the late 1890s to, the, uh, to, to French rule. And while that had uh, eventually been squashed, re uh, resistance, anti-colonial resistance never fully died in Madagascar. And it continued on and on and on. And during the World War, during the World War, when when um when when free when france was overtaken by 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 the germans because of animosity that people already had for for the french government the um, the local leadership of madagascar sided with vichy france essentially sided with uh with uh, with with uh with german with the germans in france right and a couple of years later, now Madagascar is very important, right? It's it's an important port as far as uh, on, in the Indian Ocean um, access to to the rest of the Pacific region and even into Asia. So it was very important for the Allied forces to make sure that they maintain control. They couldn't let it go this way. So the British and the French landed, and as well as supported by the likes of South Africa, you know, at the time, at the time, um, you know, white root South Africa, as well as people from the other colonies as well. Poland was there. A lot of countries that were allied with the with the with the allies, if you will, were there. Then on the other side was, of course, uh, Vichy France, who was the German-controlled France, and the Japanese, who had a very interested, a very vested interest in the space as part of of that Pacific realm. And actually, this would go on to be one of the more brutal fights in 1942 that the, that the Allied occupation, uh, the Allied forces eventually won. And this is a picture from, from, that, uh, from that era here. And, but, but, the, but the debates around that, the whole period had reinvigorated. So, Last time when we spoke about Africa's involvement in the World War, Second World War, we did not talk about Madagascar, but it's important here that we, we notice that tens of thousands of Madagascans uh, were, were involved in this struggle as well uh, through this. Uh, it was actually a site of conflict and there were concentration camps as well put in place in Madagascar through which tens of thousands of people were, 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 were subjected to. However, Eventually, due to in the aftermath of the war, as uh, the there's a spread of nationalism for reasons we've already spoken about, there was an uprising in 1947 through which you know against the French and 90 90 Madagascans were killed, and eventually, but that was not enough to stop the 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 movement, if you will, and eventually. In nineteen, oh, I just thought I should get this these figures here. Th sorry, that's not supposed to be ninety people killed. Sorry, that is a far understatement of how many people were killed. Ninety thousand people were killed in this after this rebellion, right? After this, uh, 
rebellion led by the indigenous Malagasy. I, I, I don't know why I wrote that, so please rub us that. But 90,000 people were killed. And this, you know, after the, in the aftermath of that, you know, the, the, the cause for independence was becoming more and more sympathetic. Uh, the, the Catholic Church, you know, began to side with the, with the anti-colonial movement. And a large part of this was they figured that if they could support them, they could preempt the advent of communism in the area. So, you know, eventually in 1960, the year of Africa, the year that France pulled out of a lot of its colonies, it pulled out of Madagascar as well. So uh, Madagascar achieves its independence in 1960 as well. So what are some of the key takeaways? What two territories merged in 1964 to become Tanzania? And who were they led by? What was the revolutionary group in Kenya led, born out of the Kikuyu people, but also supported by the Embu and Meru people? Who are the two quote unquote ethnic groups that defined Rwanda up until the late 20th century? Which group was the mostly targeted in the 1994 uh, genocide? To which European faction did Madagascar pledge allegiance to in 1940? And when did the country become independent? So these are some key takeaways that I want you to consider uh, as, we, as, we, as we continue with our series. Join us next week when I talk about the overthrow of colonialism in Southern Africa, which happened a little bit later than these other places. Most of the places in Southern Africa did not get their independence from colonialism until the 1970s and some going into the 1980s. And if you think about South Africa and the end of apartheid, that goes into the 1990s. So we'll be talking about that next week. But for now, enjoy this video and like and share it as, as much as you can, indeed. Thank you so much.